7, verse 9 through 11. I will praise the Lord among the nations. I will sing of you among the demons. The praises of reach to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted above, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Service. 
The next church business meeting will be August 4th, right after the service. And please read WMU updates in your highlights for, for more information. So that's all I have for that, so, uh, for the announcements. So, would everybody please pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we have come to worship, Help us see the many ways we can go about fulfilling your purpose for us. Guide us to where you would have us to go. Leave with those that cannot be here today. Leave with Ron Hatcher and his wife. Let them know you were there for them to look to, to look to. Open the hearts of those attending and any that are watching online to receive the message that Jim Heimaker has for us today. Let the Holy Spirit that is in us help us to a full understanding of that which you wish us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. God stands to eight, we sing number 333, leaning on the everlasting arms.
this life that I want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
okay. But that's the negative way of looking at it. What it really is, is the story of connecting, being reconnected. It's the story of forgiveness. It's the story of uh, lost sheep being reconnected with the shepherd. It's the story of the lost coin being reconnected with the lady. It's the story of the lost son being reconnected with his father. So I want you to um, see what the context for this. If you have your Bibles and you are looking at Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, it's, it's, it's more than just a couple of verses before this, these three stories, actually they're four stories. It's the setting. And the setting is very, very, very important. You have your Bible go to Luke chapter 15. Now listen to this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus knew that these people that were around him and listening to him were not the good people. And he connected with them. It's very interesting that Jesus connected with people, and I'm going to use a term that you know, you'll understand, for religious. It says that he hung around with, and the people that were listening to him were the sinners. And then the people that were just as bad as sinners were tax collectors all day. Now, we still face some of that kind of thing today. We do. The people who come to church all the time without really meaning to become judgmental. These stories were told not for the sake of the tax collectors and the quote sinners. These stories were told, and this is what they said, for the Pharisees, those who muttered, look who's he hanging around with. So Jesus was really not just protecting those that, that were listening to him. He was also zeroing in on the people that considered themselves the most religious. I remember at, in my own life as a young pastor, I had to face this very same thing. I was pastoring in Pensacola, Florida. And in the process of um, doing that, um, one of the ladies who attended on a regular basis, in fact, we're still friends, she came in uh, yesterday with our 56th wedding anniversary, and uh, it was on Facebook, and the, 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 the story I was telling you is of the husband, Connor, but Linda Cable is still our friend to this very, very day, Connor passed away a little while ago, but Connor um, was one of those people who never made it big um, in the music world, but he was a rock and roll guy. And in the 60s, he toured the country uh, with music, all right? By the time that I got to the church, um, Connor was uh, um, just playing every, every, day, every night uh, at a, a bar dash restaurant. And in the process of um, counseling Connor, 
and his wife who were having issues, Connor and I became friends. And I knew that Connor really wasn't a Christian. But as we became, you know, better, better friends, not just a counseling kind of relationship, Connor asked me uh, to come down to uh, down to Hiram's uh, to play. Me and the wife, my wife. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, gee, what happens if my people hear that I'm there in the bar? And uh, it sort of gets back. I wonder if there's going to be a special weekend meeting. You know, what are you doing down there? And uh, I had to really think about it. I mean, I really did. And I, I thought about, and I, I really, in my heart, I thought, you know, what would Jesus do? I mean, what really would Jesus do? And I thought, you know, I think that he would, he would go down there. And I thought, besides, not everybody's going to know that I'm there. I mean, you know, they don't know who I am. I don't go down to that, that, that bar that much. It was more than a bar. And so I said, I uh, told Connor, I said, I and um, so when we walked in, um, you know, they said, do you have any reservations? And I said, um, uh, no. I said, uh, what's the name, Amber? I said, oh, you're Connor's pastor. Well, yeah, I said, well, he has a special place that he wants you to sit. There's the dance floor and a couple of steps up. And, and that's where all the, the tables were that were supposed to be coolly important people. Or the people that paid the most. I thought, oh my word, everybody's going to see me. <laughs> and um, so I said, well, they still won't know who I am. And uh, so we, we went and we ordered. And, Connor ordered for us, and I drink. I didn't drink everything that Connor had ordered for us, uh, but the food was really delicious. And then on, after the break, you know, he comes back and he starts playing, and uh, he invites people to uh, come down to the dance floor. And he says, you know, before, um, you know, before we begin the second set, I want you to meet my friend and pastor, Jim Hamaker and his wife, Nancy. But it was out of that relationship that Connor became a Christian. Being able to go the extra length, become friends with people who aren't religious, and to somehow be able to share your faith in a way that they can accept, not just that you want to talk about. Is important. And that's what Jesus was trying to do here. He was trying to use stories to be able to say, listen, people who are lost, people who are the religious people, are just as important. So I want to read these, I want to read the, these stories. I'm going to make a couple of comments as I read, and then I'm going to point some things out. So let's, let's read these, um, starting in verse uh, 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does not he leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my sheep. And I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over all the 
in thy name not in righteous persons who do not need to repent. Sometimes well-meaning members criticize those people who spend time on purpose out in the community more than they do in the church ministry. I mean, they do. It's like, we have our own needs and we have our own committees and we have all the other things to do. Why don't you come and help us more? Not that they don't help. But help us more because we need more. And Jesus says, it's time to be able to look to those that are really lost. When it's all said and done, it says that it's an opportunity for us to be able to realize that people who are far from God are people who actually need Him, not just talk about Him. There are ways that you can look at these three stories that are very, that are very interesting. And I want you to think about them for a minute. How, how did the lost sheep get lost? How did the lost coin get lost? I mean, it's not, it's an inanimate object. How did the sun get lost? Well, the sheep got lost the way that all sheep get lost. It's not on purpose. What did they do? They just put their heads up and they just go away, not on purpose going away, they just going away to the grass, right? It's not so much on purpose getting out of the way, it's just sort of stuff that happens in the process of trying to do life, trying to get the grass. And there are a lot of people who over a period of time sort of get away from the community of faith. Not so much on purpose, but just because of life. There are people that you know and I know who no longer come to church, but could uh, after the pandemic. I'm not faulting them as much as it may sound, all right? I'm not, I'm not talking about those people who are ill and afraid and all that, but I'm just trying to say things happen and they just get away. You know people who maybe you went to church with years and years ago, but because of life and everything, they just sort of got away. I remember when I was pastor um, in one of Virginia years ago, and on the first Sunday that I was there, Parker Baptist Church, um, a man in his mm, probably late 50s, maybe early 60s, I don't know how old Paul was at the time, exactly, walked down the aisle and uh, ended up becoming a part of the church. And he said to me as we were talking during the invitation time, he said, um, I, I want to do two things. I, like to be able to talk with you afterwards, and I'd also uh, uh, like to be able to join the church. Um, I've been a, a, a Christian for a long, long time, and I, uh, I, I don't know where my membership is, but I'd just like to come on a statement that I've been a Christian and I've been baptized a long, long time ago. And so I said, well, we can talk, but my office is just full of boxes. But I'll find a chair or something. Oh, okay. So we found two chairs, one for me and one for him, and we just sat in one of the next all the boxes. And he told me a story. That uh, he was very active in church in his uh, early years. And then um, kids got involved with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and all that sort of thing. And they started being way in his job, took him away from church. Then he got involved in the community. And um, as he got involved in the community, he was trying to sort of give back, you know, trying to, excuse the term, be good, and, and trying to, you know, 
be good for the sake of others. He said, but you know, as I, I did all those things, I mean, they were done wrong with that, but it just didn't, it didn't feel in my heart the way that I thought that it would. Something was missing. He said, and so I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's time to go back to church. Maybe it's time to reconnect with church. Because that's where God lives. That's where people talk about God. And I don't have that in my life anymore. But I used to. So, so he came back. And he, he became very involved in the life of the church. Became a teacher, a deacon, and then um, doing the ministry, uh, prison ministry. All because he listened to the whispers to saying, I'm not where I used to be, and I need to be there. He wandered away just the way that she wandered away. One of the things that I think was interesting here was that they talked about. There was joy when he came back. Listen, as a pastor, I witnessed too many people who regular attenders, good attenders, um, they see somebody who hasn't been there like forever. And they walk, they walk back in. And you know what? The response often is, oh my gosh, it's good to see you. You have been here forever. Uh, how would you feel? Seriously. How would you feel if you, if you thought you would have the courage to go back where you haven't been for a long, long time, but you should if you're going to be a good Christian? And you're greeted with, oh my gosh, where have you been? How'd it make you feel? It says here that it was just joy. And the way that you greet somebody who hasn't been here like forever and ever can make all the difference in their lives. The first church, the church where I told you where Connor was. As I was a new pastor, you hear about the stories of, you know, people who used to be a part of the church and all. We had, uh, in the church, we had uh, um, some, uh, some young adults by the name of Sears, S-E-A-R-S. And there were two of the, there were two of the Sears boys that were there all the time and very involved. And then there were two others of the, of the Sears kids that, you know, just, Never would see except for maybe every once in a long while. But, this, but when I got there, the story about their father um, was very interesting. He um, at one time was um, on the chairman of the evening, a teacher, all that kind of stuff. And then um, they said, you know, I don't know, I don't know what happened to him. He had one of those midlife crises. And um, he ended up, he played the guitar, he ended up um, going to California and hooking up with a band out there. He didn't, he, he, was, he was sort of their promoter. And then on top of that, man, he, he ended up divorcing his wife and hanging out with a lot of other people. Well, that was the story of J.D. That was his relationship. <coughs> So as I was getting ready to uh, come up, I uh, was sitting on the, on, the, on the front seat, getting ready to come, come up one time. Um, somebody comes up to me and, and says, oh my gosh, Pastor, guess who's here? J.D. and some woman. Well, J.D. was sitting on the back. And I uh, oh, wow, that took a lot of courage. Former deacon, reputation like that. And um, 
So I preached a sermon, I don't remember what it was about. But J.D. and the woman, whoever she was, was the first one out. He wanted to be there in church, but he kind of hesitated about being around other people. Well, they gave us that. I mean, he's, he's lived an embarrassing life and everybody knows. So on the way out, I'd never really talked to JD at all, ever. I just knew he was by reputation that he was there in service. So on the way out, uh, he looked at me and I shook his hand the way that he shake people's hands on the way out. And I looked him straight in the eye. And I said, Welcome home, J.D. Welcome home. That response to me all the years of the world. It wasn't, oh my gosh, J.D. No, welcome home, J.D. J.D. started coming back to church. J.D. and the woman were married. I thought about J.D. when I was preaching a little bit, I was thinking, what is going on in his heart and in his life that causes him to come back to people he knows are going to be talking about? I have a hard time doing that. Well, I never asked him those questions. I just said, welcome home, J.D. Welcome home. And it made all the difference in his life. The way that you treat somebody and think about somebody makes all the difference in the world. That's why the scripture says there was great joy when the one came back. Now let's talk about the second parable. The parable of the lost coin. And it says here, um, let's, let's see. or suppose a woman has ten silver and loses one. Does she not light a lamp? Now she lights a lamp because in those days many of the houses didn't, didn't, didn't have windows. Right? So she writes, so she lights a lamp and sweeps the house and searches carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost coin. And in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The lost coin. Now, think about it for a moment. How does a coin ever get lost? It doesn't have a will of its own. Somehow or another, it's been bumped off a table or something. Uh, most of us know what it's like to lose our keys, you know. Where did I put it? Uh, there are times in which the coin probably was at some point in America. Let's see if I can illustrate it this way. If the coin is on a table, which it must have been, you know, wasn't in the purse. And what happens is that as she's doing stuff, it gets bumped. And in the process, it's lost. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't the coin's fault, right? It was the fault of the lady. It was her fault that the coin got lost. Now, scholars think that she was so concerned because it was 
a good chance that it was part of a dollar, which was the amount of money that her father gave to the husband so that he would marry it was part of the deal. And the thing that wasn't in those days, the custom was that if there ever was a divorce, and a divorce could happen very easily, you remember, those of you who studied the scripture, that there, if there was, they didn't have to go, go to court. All the husband had to say was, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And she's divorced. She doesn't have anything else to depend upon except for the dowry. That dowry belongs to her, not to the husband. Even though it was given to the husband, it was still hers. She couldn't spend it. But the coin was lost because it was knocked off. Now I want you to think about things. There are times that well-meaning people will inadvertently do something, say something, that would cause somebody else to be hurt, to be bumped, to be lost off. That happened to my son. My son is, without question, a Christian, all right? Um, he's now in his 40s. But in the early days, he was into the punk rock group stuff. He's toured the country. I mean, he's toured, he's toured, toured the world with punk rock. You can, you can get him on YouTube, all right? But the point that I want you to see is this. When he, when I was in Sally Beach, and he was you know, going to Sunday school, just like you know, you're supposed to do, This is what the Sunday school teacher told him one time, private. You know, your music is of the devil, and you are too, because guess what? When you're, you're, you're playing the devil's music. Bumped off. Not because of what he said, or did, but because of what somebody was one of those Pharisees, religious, who had an opinion that just had to be said that hurt somebody forever. Does he go to church now? Mm, not really. Uh, is he a Christian? <coughs> they pray at their house for food. I mean, even when we're not there. He has been pictured in some of the punk rock magazines. You know? It just happens to be that he has the cross and a crown of thorns as a tattoo. It's interesting that the 
that says that he came to his senses and came back to his father's house. I think that's I think that's one of the most important verses in all of Scripture. When it says that he came to his senses, he he looked at how he felt and what was going on in his life and what was not going on in his life, and he came to his senses how he felt. And then it says he did something about it. He got up. He made a decision. He says, "Well, I'm going to go to my house." But you know that's hard to do. You know, will he take it? Actually, those of you who have studied this story know that leaving was a big deal because what that what he was actually doing when he says, "Give me my inheritance before, and I'm going to leave this place," you know what that actually means. I'm counting you old man as dead. All right, give me the money that comes to me after you die, and I'm going to get out of here. I'm not having anything more to do with you. That's what all that. But he made a decision to come back. And it's very interesting that the father, as you know the story, saw him far off. And it says he ran to him. Do you, you know how important that was? I mean, you know, they had long robes, which meant that he had to pull up his robe like they pulled up the rest and run like this, which is embarrassing. That's embarrassing for a Jewish father to do. For anything. Especially somebody who is a younger son who said, I'm not even dead and out of my life. I think there are times in which it would be good for us who are here all the time to not just to spend our energies being able to look after each other, which is important. But keep our eyes open on people who are far away, who might be able to come back. And in the last story, we think about the lostness, is the lost son. Um, the older boy. The story ends, you know, you have the coin, uh, you have the sheep that was reunited, you have the coin that was reunited, you have the prodigal son that was reunited, and then you have the lost older boy, who, when Jesus told that the story, it meant like the Pharisees, who saw the young, saw the joy when the younger son came back, and it's interesting what the, the older son says. He says, when he's talking to his dad, and putting him down, he said, you know, why didn't you ever go ahead and give me a feast like you want to do for my younger boy, for my younger, for my younger son? Actually, he didn't say, my younger son, my younger brother. He says, your son. <laughs> so he's been hanging out with prostitutes. How do you know that? Then talk to us. And I know the people who have gossiped about people who are far away. Well, you know, you must have done X, Y, and Z. That's what I heard. You don't know. And you don't know. That's what the older son did. Well, it was your son, and on top of that, he's been hanging out with prostitutes. Oh, how did he know that? And the sadness of these stories of Boston. The older boy who was the good old, the good two shoes boy who was there and did everything that was supposed to be done as a quote, good Christian was lost. He never experienced the joy of his father. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to think about something as we close. The scripture says that he came to his senses. And um, 
Every one of the lost ones had a sense of joy when they were going to return. And I just want to ask, what, to what degree when you come to this place, do you experience joy? Not just that you're glad uh, to be able to see those whom you know and love them for all the years, that's appropriate. And that you care. But to what degree do you sense us, uh, have a sense of joy when you come to be reconnected with your Lord and Savior? Here as you worship and as you study the scriptures together. So they came to the senses that I'm asking you just to be able to reflect on what's needed, what could change for you to experience true joy by being really deeply connected to your, your heavenly Father. So, Father, we come to you and say thank you for the opportunity of being able to be here to study your word. Help us not only to be able to come to our senses, but like the younger boy, be able to have the courage to do whatever is needed to do, to be able to be reconnected with you so that there truly is a sense of joy in our life. We ask these things for your sake, as well as for our sake, for the sake of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. If you would now, when we come to the time of invitation, the uh, song is number 182, the parting song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Let's stand and sing, would you come as a spirit is.